Hello Steelers, and welcome to this tutorial video where I'm going to show you how I made this mine crater for the First World War. Mine is 15mm in scale, but this would work equally well with any scale, and the techniques are the same, just make the crater bigger or smaller. First of all though, let's have a look at the history of mining in the First World War. I will put some chapters in the video below, so if you don't want to listen to the history you can just skip forward to the build. As soon as the trench lines became established in late 1914, mining under the enemy's positions began. As early as 1915, the British lay mines under German lines at places like Luz, where they fired huge amounts of explosive to try to destroy the enemy lines. During the Battle of the Somme, the most famous footage of a mine exploded was recorded on the first day. This was at Hawthorne Ridge, and the crater is left still in evidence on the crest of the ridge. Also, other mines were blown on the Somme, including Loch Nagar by the side of La Boiselle, this mine was blown in front of the German lines to create a high lip and stop enfilading machine gun fire coming from the fortified village of La Boiselle as the British troops attacked across the open ground. Over at Vimy, the French and then later the British forces mined and countermined with the Germans, blowing various mines over time. Hill 60 near Zillabeek is a home to the famous Caterpillar crater, blown in June of 1917. This was part of the Amessines Ridge operation, where no less than 19 mines were blown prior to the successful attack of the high ground. General Plumer's Chief of Staff, Sir Charles Harrington, is reported to have said to the press on the eve of the battle, Gentlemen, I don't know whether we are going to make history tomorrow, but at any rate, we shall change geography. Several of these mine craters are preserved today, the most famous one being the Pool of Peace of Spranbrook Molen. Exploding mines below the enemy's lines wasn't the only thing occurring below the ground during the war, and an entire subterranean conflict was also ongoing, with the opposing sides determinedly trying to stop the enemy getting an advantage. Men would break into each other's mine shafts, and vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting would break out. Alternatively, camouflets were detonated to destroy the opposing mine workings. The men who did this work were incredibly brave and had to work in absolute silence. They were mainly picked from the civilian mine workers in their home countries, as they had the skills to work in the cramped and suffocating conditions of the mines. You can find out more about this subterranean warfare in the book Beneath of Flanders Fields, The Tunnelers' War. I shall put an Amazon affiliate link to it in the video description below. So I wanted to replicate the scars of these mines on the battlefield of miniature. I used an off-cut of blue insulation foam, which I had from making a different crater, and I marked it out roughly where I wanted the edges of the slope to be. This is about 5cm thick, so it's perfect for my 15mm figures. You may want to get thicker or thinner foam, depending on your figures. Then, using a long bladed knife, I carved out the edges at the angle to give the crater some shape. Be careful, cut away from yourself and also use a sharp knife. This will blunt quickly, so have a few extra blades ready just in case. I did try a foam cutter here, which will work, but mine broke. Once I had the outer shape carved, I cut out the two centre circles. I wanted this to be two overlapping craters, so I worked with this in mind. You could easily make yours just one crater, but I thought two would look interesting on the tabletop. It doesn't matter if this is rough, as long as you cut the centre out. Then, with the holes cut out, it's time to shape the interior of the crater using the same technique as before, and that is, cutting at an angle to create a slope falling away to the centre of the crater. Don't worry again if this is not too neat, we're just working on getting the basic shape at this point, you just need the slope to be apparent. With the basic shape of the crater now finished, I use sandpaper to smooth down the edges, both the exterior and interior. This was just to remove some of the roughness that occurred during the cutting, and the small pieces of foam that had come loose but hadn't been removed fully. Then I turned my attention to the base. For this I am using 3mm plastic card, as I had bought it by mistake and I hadn't really found a use for it. You can use anything you like, but plastic card is good as it's durable and it doesn't warp. It's not cheap though, so I'm glad this didn't go to waste. After marking out the edge of the crater on the sheet with a pen, I cut out the rough shape to get rid of the rectangular shape of the card piece. This was quite difficult given the thickness of the card, 2mm thick card would be a lot easier to cut. However, with various snaps I got there eventually and I just sanded down the edges of the plastic card just to smooth it out and get rid of some of the breakages. I also used some clippers just to trim off the sharp bits and make this a bit easier. As I said, 2mm plastic card would work perfectly for this and be twice as easy to work with. Now I had the basic crater shape and the base ready to go, so I glued them together using 502 wood glue. 
This is extremely tacky wood glue that works well with the plastic card. I didn't want to melt the foam with plastic glues, so this seemed like the best solution. I could have used spray mount glue, but that can also be messy. Speaking of messy, here comes the fun part. Using polyfiller, or in my case a cheap version of wall filler from Wilco's, I began building up the crater. This is called Spackle in the US, and you can use any cheap filler product here. Just make sure it's the stuff that doesn't shrink. Using my fingers and wearing gloves, I apply dollops of the stuff and work it into the bottom and edges of the crater, making sure everything is completely coated in a thin layer. This is going to give you your base texture, so make sure you do this carefully and completely cover the foam and the base. I then left the crater to dry, preferably overnight and possibly longer depending on how thick your filler is. To be completely safe, I'd give it a few days to let the filler dry rock hard. Then, using a big old brush, I applied undiluted PVA across the entire model. I mixed some silver sand with railway modeler's ballast and cork fragments. I then poured this mixture over the glue, adding bits of cork and ballast in random areas. I tipped off the excess, and then I go over some of the cork and ballast areas with watered down PVA glue. This will then dry solid, and make the model much more hard wearing for the tabletop. Again, leave the crater to dry at least overnight, maybe even for a few days, until the watered down PVA is completely solid. Then using a rattle can spray, I sprayed the entire model in burnt umber. You can do this with a brush, but it may dislodge some of the ballast or the cork. Spraying it will seal the cork and ballast even more, so I think it's better to do it this way. Make sure you do it in a well ventilated room, or preferably outside, and ensure that the entire crater is covered, giving two coats if necessary. Once the spray is dry, this shouldn't take too long, just a few hours, I began the fun of dry brushing. For this, I use a big makeup brush which should be soft and wide for the best effects. The first dry brush is with Deco Art Fawn, a cheap acrylic that I use a lot for dry brushing. Dip your brush in the paint and then wipe off as much as you can, working slowly across the crater, I brush the paint over the highlights. Don't go mad with this at first, because you can always add some more layers but it is difficult to take them off. I then go back using Stone Grey by Vallejo and do the same, but with slightly lighter layers and concentrating on the raised areas more. And then finally, I used Iraqi Sand by Vallejo to do the uppermost parts of the crater and give it a really granular feeling of colour grading from the darkest parts to the lightest parts. So the basic painting is completed and you could use the craters as they are. They look perfectly good and will fit on any tabletop. I spray varnish the model for protection at this point and left it to dry once again. However, I wanted to add some more to the crater and just give it a water filled look. I bought some Vallejo still water resin and using US Olive Drab by Vallejo I mix the two together in a plastic cup. Once the paint and resin had mixed well, I carefully poured it into the base of the crater. I popped any bubbles I saw with the end of a screwdriver and teased the mixture into the edges just to get good coverage. This was my first time using resin, and I had a few hard lessons ahead of me. I quickly realised I didn't actually like the look of the mud, so I mixed some resin with some flat earth and dark military green, both by Vallejo, into a cup until I got the colour I was after, and I added this to the resin in the crater. Then, using the screwdriver, I mixed the two resins together the best I could. It wasn't perfect, but I found it to be actually quite a pleasing look, so I went with it anyway. Also. As the resin dried, I realised that I put too much in at once, and it cracked in places and shrunk. So I went back a few more times with thin layers of resin over the top to fill in the cracks. I should have done this in the first place and worked the layers up slowly, but you live and learn. However, I managed to finally get there, and the last thing to do was to blend the crater into my tabletop, and this I achieved by adding patches of static grass around the bottom edges. I used undiluted PVA glue to attach the grass in patches, I don't use an applicator, I find blowing on the grass allows it to stand up anyway. And then once this had dried, it was done. So here is the crater, completed and with some 15mm figures in to give you a sense of scale. It was a long but easy process to make this model, and you can ignore any number of the steps in this as you like. As I mentioned, if you use a resin, I would be inclined to add thin layers and allow them to dry before adding more and then building it up slowly, but for a first attempt I'm happy with the results.
I hope you've enjoyed this video, please let me know in the comments below, and if you are not subscribed to the channel, please do so. And also check out my Patreon and channel memberships to get early, ad-free access to all my videos. Thank you for watching.